Okay. Let's talk about problems right quick with pregnancy. We already discussed too excessive bleeding, right? So if it's after the pregnancy, obviously you wouldn't do a fundal massage after the pregnancy or before the pregnancy, but excessive bleeding, uh, we want to control that. Normal bleeding is 500 uh, milliliters, so the, uh, ex expect that. We talk about the spontaneous abortion or miscarriage. Remember to use the term miscarriage, not, not a spon or abortion, and uh, we determine that. that. That would be some part of your uh, assessment questions, okay, in the paragravita, then ectopic pregnancy. So let's look at this. I've got a picture, ectopic, outside the uterus, okay, and I added a couple pictures for us to, to see. So this is a normal in anyone in childbearing years, which is in my books between about 12 and 50, I've, I've assisted the delivery on a 12-year-old and I've, I've heard about people 50 delivering babies. Okay, so anyhow, and so in, within childbearing years, one thing that you will note that uh, when a patient comes in the hospital and they're determining, hey, we need to see if they're pregnant, you know, like for x-rays and stuff, okay, they're going to do a pregnancy test, all right, if they're in childbearing years. Why do they do a pregnancy test instead of just asking the patient, is there any possibility of you being pregnant? Because they don't know sometimes. They don't know they yeah. lie. Yeah. Right. They may not know. They will. They may lie. Okay. Uh, that 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 is quite common, especially in uh, younger younger ages. The, the you know if your mom's in the room and you go. The nurse comes in and says, hey, is there, we need to do an x-ray. Is there any possibility of you being pregnant? That's what my nurse no. said. She got me out of the room. Are uh -uh. you pregnant? No. So, yeah. They're, they're asked that on the side, but most of the time they're going to take a urine sample, dip your urine, see, check the pregnancy, okay, at a minimum. Okay, the uh, same way with, with dads and stuff. Uh, I mean, the husband's in the room, ask mom, is there any, any chance of you being pregnant? Oh, no, 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 uh, because, I don't know, they just, they have a tendency, patients have a tendency not to tell the truth, so to avoid all that, they just check to make sure that they're pregnant. Now, did you have a question? Oh, I was going to say, why can't, like, they just send, like, the other person, like, out to the room and then ask? Sometimes, yeah, sometimes I do, but it's it's a little weird. It's awkward, you know, uh, to do that, especially with. And, and a lot of times, the that's a good question, but a lot of times the parents won't like if it's a parent, they won't go out of the room. They can say, "Well, you can ask her any questions in front of me if you want." Right? What do anyway, you have to hide? Uh, and and to carry over that. You can't withhold information from the guardian, the legal guardian. If the, if the patient is below the age of 18, you can't withhold information from the parents. The parents are the legal guardian. You are, by law, you have to tell the parents. Okay? That's that's a biggie. You can't withhold that information. So, uh, they just, to avoid all that, they just sort of test. So, here, I, I plug this picture in so you can sort of see outside it's it's uh, outside the uterus in the fallopian tube here and it starts to uh, the embryo starts to grow at a very rapid rate okay, which causes pinpoint pain so you picture where the fallopian tubes are if you stick your finger I don't have fallopian tubes obviously, <laughs> but if you stick your finger in your belly button and go over here that's the level of your fallopian tubes Okay, the, the females. What? The level. Okay, here. So if you have pinpoint pain, meaning that uh, you go, it hurts really bad right here. Okay, and you are within childbearing years, uh, then that could be an ectopic pregnancy, or your patient is could be have an ectopic pregnancy. You want to do a sonogram there to make sure, okay? 
because uh, it's life-threatening. The picture over here, which is not in your notes, if you keep looking, you'll never find it. Oh. This is a ruptured ectopic oh, pregnancy. Yeah. You start having blood and oh. here, you can see the blood start to bleed and uh, cause life-threatening conditions, life-threatening bleeding, period peritonitis, okay? Anyhow, this a lot of times is missed, okay, uh, by, by the doctors. Yeah, this is, this is the head here of the embryo, okay? Anyway, uh, so endopic pregnancy, watch out for, be aware of that, all right, in the if when when you're doing an assessment or you you have a patient like say in childbearing years having pinpoint pain here uh i would like if it was my wife or daughter that type of pain i would always the doctor would do a sonogram to make sure that that went in that topic pregnancy because they're missed For, you know you have your descending colon on the on the left so a lot of times it's they say oh you have real bad gas pains or an air pocket you get an air pocket in your descending colon, it causes a lot of lower abdominal pain. Okay, a really bad lower abdominal pain. Okay, so it, it sort of gets masked there, and they're just thinking, oh, it's, it, or cramps. Okay, the mistake is, oh, it's, uh, you know, you're, you're starting your, the process of your menstrual cycle and you have cramps or whatever. So it's, it's, a, it's a deal, it's an issue. Okay, so uh, keep, keep that in mind because uh, the doctors miss it a lot. These other two are just pre-delivery -emer pre emergencies. So second, third trimester, what happens is here the patient gets what's called pre-eclamptic, okay, where they start getting headaches in the edema, they get the cankles, all right, they, their lower extremities get really swollen up. And the key to preeclampsia is hypertension or high blood pressure. So this patient becomes hypertensive. This is the time, so this patient with good prenatal care, this is the time when this, the doctor, the OB doctor says, we're gonna put you on bed rest. All right? And they put you on bed rest till you get this condition, your blood pressure down. Have you, have you guys ever heard of that before? The mom's going on bed rest? What's the problem with that? You go to the doctor and the doctor says, hey, I'm gonna put you on bed rest for uh, two months. That means, let me, let me define that, because it's sort of like, well, what is that? That means you get up out of bed to go to the bathroom and to wash, and then you get back in bed, okay? That's what they really mean as bed rest. So, so what is the problem? What's the practical problem with that? Their muscles will be weak. I don't know. No, I mean practical problems. Like everyday it's, life. They'll get scared. I don't know. Bored. <laughs> Not concerned with boredom. Not concerned with you being scared. Y'all may not be, you may not know this. This may sort of be outside your sort of level of understanding at your age. Work. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Mom has to work. Most families now have two incomes. Most mom and dads work. It's not like the leave it to beaver age where mom didn't work. Most moms work. And they, y'all know, even know who leave it to beaver is? No. YouTube it one time. It's, it's an old show way back in the 60s where, you know, the wife was all dressed up when the husband came home from work and she stayed home and cooked and cleaned and had babies, okay? That is disgusting. Hey, just look it up one day. Uh, What's it called? Leave it to Beaver. But anyway, uh, so they, re they rely on the two incomes. If they don't have bed rest, you can't work, so you lose that income, correct? Okay, so they may not be able to do that. Still got to eat, right? So you got to eat, and okay. 
to the uh, This happened to a friend of mine, uh, not a close friend, but she was a 911 dispatcher, went pregnant, obviously, and got preeclamptic. The doctor told her, yeah, you have to go on bed rest. Uh-uh. We'll be homeless. Okay? We would really rely on our income. So she went to work. She was still preeclamptic. Her blood pressure was still up there. But there was no bed rest. Okay? Uh... Yeah, because it's, it's just outside of your understanding right now where you think, oh, you, if you don't work, you don't eat, okay? So uh, she was had to work, and uh, she continued to do that, and then she got eclampsia. So what eclampsia is is at the point where they start having seizures, and they're life-threatening seizures, okay? So... She, this friend of mine got eclamptic. She had a seizure at work, okay, and it caused her to uh, throw a clot, and then uh, she had a stroke from there. The stroke ended up putting her into a vegetative state, and then she was in ICU long enough to, to, to have the baby. So the baby was born through C-section, and, but she died. She was, the clot, it was a huge stroke uh, through the seat that the, that the seizure caused, okay? So when when they say, hey, you're a bed rest, they really mean that, okay? But there's reasons why you, sometimes you can't go on bed rest. You just can't, you can't do it. You have to work, all right? So eclampsia, Preeclampsia is the headache, the cankles, the hypertension, okay? And the eclampsia is where the patient starts to seize. To, by just, just definition here, so you know, be familiar if you hear the terms. Supine hypotensive syndrome is just where the mom lays flat. You'll notice if you, when you're around moms a lot, they lay on their side, right? They, can't, they don't really lay flat. They have this big baby laying down. If they lay flat, they lay flat on the vena cava, which drops the blood pressure. So that's just the supine hypotension syndrome. So you don't want mom laying flat. You want mom trying to sit up or laying on the side to push the baby off of the vena cava. Okay. Later, last six weeks when we talk about trauma, if we had to backboard a mom, put them on a backboard because of the spinal precaution, what they would do, they would tilt the backboard up and then wedge it right? so they don't don't lay mom flat. Uh, it's a syndrome. And I've actually never seen it, uh, but I haven't backboarded a lot of moms. Right? Most time, you know, we, we try not to do that. So three pre-delivery emergencies. <laughs> Other ones is a placenta abrupto, and placenta previa. Abrupto just sounds bad, doesn't it? Abrupto. Okay, it is. So, placenta abrupto is where the placenta abruptly detaches from the uterus. Okay? And then the placenta previa is where the uterus sort of moves over the opening of the birth canal or it's attached there, okay? So, it, you're not, this picture here, the baby's not coming out because the placenta is in the way, right? Mm -hmm. So this is, they would do a C-section on, on this patient here, okay? And then placenta abrupto, uh, they will usually have to do a C-section as well. Now, the way that you can tell these apart, because we have these telltale signs of all these emergencies, right? You know, like chest pain, someone sitting on me. My chest feels like someone's sitting on me. Uh, it's a telltale sign, I think. My throat feels like it's closing. What's that? Um, feels like the telltale sign. Am I, I feel like my throat's closing up on me. My tongue's swelling. My tongue. Allergic reaction. Anaphylaxis, right. Allergic reaction, right. So you have these 
<coughs> sort of telltale signs. Anyway, uh, hemiparalysis. What's it? That's a telltale oh, sign. Hemiparalysis, huh? Stroke. Stroke. Weak grip strength, maybe. Stroke. Okay. Use are fast. Arm drift. Those are all telltale signs of, of a stroke. Anyway, so the telltale sign of placenta abrupto is painful, bright red vaginal bleeding. Painful, bright red vaginal bleeding. And the telltale sign of placenta previa is painless, bright red vaginal bleeding. So abrupto, it sounds bad, painful. Right? That's how I remember it. And a previa, painless. It's just, just the opposite. So a couple, a couple quick emergencies there. I would say rare, but uh, like we like we talked about before, most of the time, moms go they go to the hospital, right? We don't pre-hospital wise in, in my location. We don't come in contact with a lot of them because they're already, they go to the hospital. They have good prenatal care. They, they go to the hospital when they're in labor. They plan things out. Don't have a lot of dealings with that. Okay? So, uh, when you go to the OB floor, be something good to talk to the OB nurse about. You know, hey, what's the percentage of this placenta previa and placenta abrupta? It's their field of study, so they're going to know, okay? Talk to them about that ectopic pregnancy. That's something that they be somewhat, yeah, maybe familiar with, okay? Resuscitation-wise, uh, remember, below the heart rate of 60, we don't start compressions, right? So we don't start compressions here. The, uh, they have this, in, it's called an inverted triangle. Anybody want to go into neonate, NICU? No, nope. probably pretty good. I have really thick skin to do that. Uh, when they they learn this inverted triangle, okay, for uh, resuscitation. So what we do first is we warm, dry, suction, and stimulate. Like you said in the video, they warm and they dry. They suction, they stimulate, tactile stimulation, and they're rubbing the baby, trying to stimulate them to cry, get the heart rate up, get them crying, exercise those lungs, right? It works the majority of the time. Stimulate them. If that doesn't work, and I'm saying quickly, we don't stimulate them for a number of minutes, and then this is quick. So, hey, if you're not, if, if baby's all smurfed and you're tactile stimulating them and and, and suctioning and trying to stimulate them, uh, it's within just just a small amount of time, okay, you would apply a bioc of responding. So that might doesn't work within just a couple minutes. Uh, and, and I'm not really on that side that I wait that long. I'll give them blow by for about a minute. I'm like, no, and I'm going to start bagging them, okay? If I bag them and I don't see almost a instant response to the bag valve mask and I'm going to intubate okay because babies uh, they decompensate very very quickly they compensate for a while but they decompensate very quickly and the last thing that you want is to drop this newborn's heart rate the heart rate needs to stay up 100 plus right up, up above 100 we want to see that bradycardic baby, really bad sign. So we don't want we don't want that. So I'm going to intubate them, start oxygenating them. That heart rate doesn't pick up. Like I said, below 60, we'll start compressions. And this is like bam, 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 bam type things. And then if it doesn't work, we'll start giving them medication to fix to help fix that. And we'll start pushing some epinephrine. Get that heart rate up. Heart rate in an infant is vital. Rate, rhythm, pressure in an adult, heart rate, vital in an infant, okay? So you got to do this. This is a very quick process here, okay? This over to the side, I put this in for CPR reasons, right? Uh, pulse check, 
you know, you've been in a CPR, you see them would do a pulse check. And they don't pulse check, they shouldn't pulse check very long. I think what we, what we learned in CPR is 30 seconds uh, drops uh, coronary perfusion by 20 seconds, right? Each time they stop compressions for 30 seconds, it drops coronary perfusion pressure by 20 seconds. Don't quote me on that. I have to look on the, my cheat sheet again. But anyway, pulse check greater than, pulse check for an infant at this point here would be less than 10 seconds. Beyond 10 seconds, look at this, you increase the mort mortality by 40%. That means you increase their probability of death by 40%. Okay? 20 seconds by 70%. You just killed your baby. You just killed the patient by jacking around, looking for pulses, okay, instead of doing compressions. All right? So it, it's not as drastic as in, in an adult, but it's still, when you stop doing compressions as a, on an adult, you, you decrease their uh, coronary perfusion pressure. So you have to, uh, compressions are, are vital to keep up, especially in an infant. Okay. But don't want, <clears throat> not necessarily something to memorize. Uh, I just want you to be familiar with it. This inverted triangle, if it comes up for some reason in conversation, uh, this is what they're doing. Have gen just general knowledge of it. Breach babies means they're coming out backwards, okay? Uh, or not head first, let's say. So you can deliver this baby butt first. It's just you just have to remember that the head is the last thing that comes out, and the head is the slowest thing that comes out. The the legs and the that are going to come out. So here, as you deliver the, you go and you you're you're examining mom, and instead of seeing a smiling face, you see butt cheeks, right? <laughs> you can still deliver that baby. It's just that you remember that the legs are folded up underneath. So you have to sort of reach in and, and manipulate the legs a little bit, okay? And then deliver the baby the normal way. And just remember that the babies, once the thorax comes out, they try to breathe. So you may have to lift the head. Remember, they're coming out face down, right? So you may have to reach in the birth canal and lift up the face off of the, 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 the I guess what would be the floor of the birth canal. But the, uh, I'm sure there's a better term for it, but the, you just lift the head up and then deliver the head quick, 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 push mom. Not precipitous, but quick, right? A, a breach. We already talked about this, thunder massage, right? Treat for shock, keep them warm. I start pushing some fluids on them, uh, trying to control the bleeding. And then uh, the, the spontaneous abortion or miscarriage, okay? Try to, uh, you know, you want the tissue, they're going to do path pathology studies on the tissue. And then, uh, you know, treat mom for shock. Look for complications, a lot of postpartum bleeding perhaps. Twins, not really a problem, okay? Just remember that uh, now you have multiple patients, but more than likely, uh, they're going to be delivered in the hospital. If they have any prenatal care, they're going to arrange for this mom to come in or check them in. They're going to uh, induce labor. They're going to control that delivery. The neonate doctors are going to be there. The neonate nurses are going to be there. They're going to control this uh, tightly because there's multiple patients. What about that one lady that had eight? So that means that each one had their own placenta? That are probably so, or they share. Eight's a lot, man. It's funny. Here they come. <laughs> but they were definitely control doctors are in there controlling that uh, for any type of resuscitation okay where's my
Oh, I skipped over them somehow. Okay, I must have pushed that button too hard. Anyway, very, very rare presentations. And all of the people I know, I've never heard anybody talk about this. Okay? But again, it's not my wheelhouse, so they, they may happen. The only thing that happens there, if you go down and you're inspecting mom for crowning, and you see a foot kicking out there, okay, or uh, doesn't show the other one, you, you don't have a little seizure here. If they uh, see a foot or a hand, so you, you have a limb presentation, either you have a foot or a hand, you know, you go down, instead of you want to see the eyes looking at you, see someone, hey, you know, uh, C-section. You cannot deliver this the, a limb presentation except for C-section, okay? And the baby's still going to come try to come out, right? The labor process won't stop because you don't have an OR available, right? It's going to continue that way. So this is a true emergency, like it says. It's a, a very rare but true emergency that they're going to, mom's going to require C-section, okay? The other one, a rare presentation, is what's called a prolapse cord. You go down and uh, let's let's set this one up at Walmart. You go because it's it's more visual that way. Mm -hmm. So you go to Walmart and you know uh, whatever, and she's like delivering now. The next push is going to deliver, or and all of a sudden you go down and you say, okay, I'm going to do a visual inspection, and you see a an umbilical cord coming out. Mom won't deliver here, okay? So what, what takes place here is remember the two arteries in one vein? So what, what would take place here is that you would palpate the umbilical cord to see if there's a pulse. If there's a pulse, then that means the baby has getting blood supply, right? Mm -hmm. If there's no pulse, what? No pulse in the umbilical cord, no blood, no blood flow, correct? So the baby's head is acting as a tourniquet. So what would you do? Yeah, they'd probably go C-section here. You would uh, put your fingers in the birth canal. You have one set on the pulse, okay, put on the cord. Put your fingers in the birth canal and lift up the head. Feel for the head. Lift up the head. Okay. And if the pulse, let's say, let me back up. You feel the cord and there's no pulse. No pulse in the cord. Okay. So put your fingers in the birth canal, lift up the head, and now you have a pulse. Okay. Guess what you are? You're stuck. There, don't like. Oh, good, a pulse, and drop the head back down, and then all of a sudden, no. oh, no pulse. So once you lift the head and there's a pulse, you're stuck in that position. With this person, because uh, go to the OR. So they would uh, cover mom up. They go through the emergency room. So they go go to the OR. And you go, hey, I was just shopping. <laughs> what in the world? You know? And uh, anyway, prolapse cord. You don't really be able to get the pulse back, right? It's like taking those points off the scoreboard. You don't want to do that. Well, football now. You don't really take the points off the scoreboard in golf, but come on, get it together. But the. Uh, <clears throat> So you know they make a touchdown, they, they have a penalty, they, they take the points off, that's a penalty. Anyway, yeah I know, one of those unimportant sports are like golf. But they, uh, so that's a prolapse cord, like I said, it's, it's rare in nature as well, okay? Twins, talk about that. Be aware just as if the mom's addicted to alcohol or drugs or something, that the birth weight of the baby may be low, and secondly, they may be addicted to whatever mom's taken. So they may come out 
a crack baby or a heroin baby, right? So they, they may not be breathing, right? So you may uh, give them, they come out, they have to give them some Narcan or something and resuscitate them. You know that inverted triangle? That takes place a lot of times with addicted babies. Okay, so they, they come out and they're addicted to heroin because there's certain drugs that will cross the brain barrier barriers or certain drugs will cross that and then the placenta barrier so there's certain drugs and medications that will cross over and affect the baby so those are things that moms are concerned about when they take uh, medication they will say make sure that it doesn't cross the placenta barrier and affect the baby but this sort of a picture here you can see I guess sort of a a smaller baby in weight and, a, and the, a normal size baby. Okay. They look both bad, right? Yeah. Yeah. Welcome to the world. No. <laughs> and the only way you would get into fetal demise if you worked in the OB. Anybody want to work OB type? Labor and delivery? Okay. So you may get into this where the baby has died and either through delivery or sometimes they die before delivery and uh, sometimes they the mom has to go ahead and deliver the baby naturally even though the baby's uh, it's not not living so that would have a you need that big support group there okay for, for mom uh, I don't fortunately I've never had to do this but the uh, this would be probably the only time I would lie to my patient because the uh, mom has a picture of what her baby is supposed to look at, right? If the baby's been dead in the in the womb for days or you know weeks or whatever, it's not going to look like that. It could have skin sort of sloughing off, be real discolored. Okay, so mom would say, "Let me hold my baby. Let me hold, even though it's not alive. Let me hold it." I'm like, "No." Let's wait till you get to the hospital, and then I would I say I can't I can't let you do that. I would lie to the patient. I could I could give mom the baby and let her hold it, but not in in my world not in the back of an ambulance because mom's support group is me, right? So I want to make sure that she has her support group there. Maybe they'll clean up the baby a little bit, do do something, but uh, we don't the brain doesn't forget anything. And it sure doesn't forget pictures like that. So, to me, it's better for mom to have uh, the, the picture of her baby that, that's up here. That, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. We don't want to. We don't want to see that because we won't. We don't. People. We won't. Uh, especially moms, they won't forget that. So that that's sort of important. Okay. So hey, just one other thing before we we shift gears. Sis babies, because I heard just about before Greg talked about. Now this is not a delivery emergency. These sis babies they take six months or so, eight, six eight months. Unfortunately, I've had a lot of I've had a handful of sis babies. Okay, there's nothing that you can do about that. Okay, it's a pre-hospital emergency anyway. Uh, and and they it's a syndrome. So they're learning nonstop on on what to do with, with with the babies. Okay, different fatalities. They study this and they say, okay, don't don't feed them on their back because they think that they have a tendency to aspirate and and di different things. Usually, a sid baby comes in and the mom puts the baby down for a nap and they don't wake up. The mom mom is hyper aware that the baby has not woke up in a certain length of time. So they're like, why is my baby not woke up? So they go in there and they're already, uh, they're already dead. Baby's in cardiac arrest. Okay, and they've probably been that way for a long time. A lot of times, pre-hospital wise, you get a SIDS baby and they're already in rigor mortis. Savvy rig rigor mortis. Mm -hmm. Rigor mortis is a temporary stiffening of the, of the muscles. So you take the head and rigor mortis shows up first in the neck so you try a head tilt chin lift and if the neck is really stiff that that means the baby's in rigor which is in 
one of the obvious signs of death is rigor mortis. The other sign of death is dependent morbidity, okay, which means the baby's been like laying on their back. So they have sort of discoloration on their back where the blood has pulled on here. So dependent lividity. Rigor mortis and dependent lividity are two obvious signs of death, irreversible death, okay? So uh, we usually don't do CPR that way. Uh, I never do CPR that way because the fact that the baby's in rigor or dependent lividity, dependent lividity you're just giving false hope to the mom in the family. That's all you're doing because it's obvious sign of death. They're not, the baby's not going to survive that. Okay? So you have to sort of, in my world, you have to prepare the mom for that and it takes, takes some time. Okay? And you get, you know, parents there, the husband there, what, whoever is in the support group. All right? The other thing that I warn you about because I had the tragedy of doing this uh, in in a short period of time I ran a CPR on a four day old four uh, week old and a four month old okay and they all died the same way by suffocation and it was all an accident it was a horrible accident but what happens is is that mom or dad okay or sibling one was their their, their uh, brother suffocated them because what happens is you know everybody will oh look you're sleeping with the baby how cute let's take a selfie I'm about to go to sleep with my baby mm -mm. we have a crib for a reason right okay put the baby in the crib because what happens is we have a tendency to roll over Moms are tired anyway, right? They're really tired. So they're, they're really tired, and uh, they roll over, and when they go to sleep, man, they're asleep. So they roll over, and they go to sleep, and they roll over on baby, and the baby's soft. They just sort of push them into the mattress, roll over on them like a pillow, and they don't notice it until it's too late. It, it happens the same way all the time. So if you know family members or whatever that sleeps with their baby, warn them about that. Hey. You can suffocate them very easy that way. Okay, that happens a lot. And it's tragic because now you, the family member has the guilt that they killed their baby, right? Or the little kid has the guilt that they killed their si brother or sister. Anyhow, uh, not to be doom and gloom, but that's a... <laughs> too late, yeah, but... That's, that's real important because you guys know a lot of people and this is very common that takes place. And we want to sort of, because part of your job as a medical practitioner of some sort or in some field is education, right? So you want to educate them. Hey, no, let's not do that. That's really deadly. I've seen it way too many times. Three times in like three weeks. Okay, but a lot more than that. And there's nothing we can do. They're already either in rigor mortis or uh, there's really not, nothing we can do <clears throat> at that point. Okay? Good? Ready to deliver babies?